law firms represent commercial interest. And the University of Michigan would be a very discreet way to camouflage contacts that are going on. Mm -hmm. And we would love to know who are these people really representing. And, and when you take the, the reported activities of the Chinese and you look at the seriousness of what's going on, no one wants to talk about it. But really, the words sabotage, espionage, and treason are perhaps appropriate to apply at this time. And, and in my estimation, as someone who was trained almost on a weekly basis during my engagement in the Cold War by security officials, prosecutions should be occurring of, of these individuals who are participating in this. And the U.S. Attorney for Eastern Michigan should be making an effort to convene a grand jury and call people before a grand jury and say, what's going on here? And as someone who came up through physics and knows a little bit about nuclear and thermonuclear weapons, uh, what the Rosenbergs did to America pales in comparison to what is going on now. I mean, we, we're clearly seeing the greatest theft of technology and know-how in the history of civilization. And it's very ironic if you go to a museum in Istanbul, Turkey, on the Silk Road, there's displays concerning Chinese porcelain. And it's said, under the threat of death, Chinese workers labor to make porcelains, but they could not reveal the secrets of this technology to anybody else, because then, of course, porcelain would lose its value. Right. Wow, <clears throat> that really is amazing. You had mentioned the U.S. Attorney in, uh, for Eastern Michigan, and uh, that's Barbara McQuaid, would that be? That's this correct, time? a, a yeah. Democrat from Ann Arbor. Right. Well, uh, and um, I, I know that there, a little bit later we'll get into a lot more things here as far as other corporations, because it's not just the University of Michigan that we're talking about. We're talking about corporations and a long history of corporations that are uh, kind of playing both sides um, for their, for, on behalf of the, uh, the people at the top, the CEOs, the, the, the board members, um, and, uh, and even in corporations, the stockholders. It, it, uh, they're, they're placing the interest of themselves over the interest of us, of the nation. You know, we, we really need to be thinking about, um, you know, the, the rights of the entity, of, of the, the person, uh, versus uh, the rights of, of us as a nation and you know whether we're going to continue to go downhill and just hand everything over. Uh, well, you're saying that the Chinese are stealing. Uh, there's a lot of just uh, complacency and uh, you know from the little guy who just is apathetic and, and, and doesn't care about what's going on to, to the people at the top that are actively engaged in just handing over everything. Much, well, for, much of what we uh, uh, are giving to them, we're giving to them legally. They're not breaking any laws, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a wise thing for us to do. And when you think about how venture capitalists work, that uh, American venture capitalists will invest in a startup company that has a good idea, a good invention, good intellectual property. But then they, they need to develop it to a certain point, but then they need an exit strategy. Mm. So they need to be able to take have a way to take to get their money out to get their pro their their uh, profit on their investment, and what's happening is that a lot of times that exit strategy involves that technology going to China. Well, something has changed in the last two decades <clears throat> that affects the whole concept of classified and unclassified. The the time period now from from the laboratory to the battlefield may be as small as nine months. Whereas if you go back to the atomic bomb, it was 1936 mm -hmm. when fission was discovered, and then it was 1945 till we dropped the bomb. But now if you take the Humvee, for example, our bad experiences in Iraq, it didn't take them long to figure out how to make these ambush-protected, mine-resistant vehicles. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole idea of civilian and military technology has gotten very, very blurred. And electronics is a very good example. <clears throat> the the solid-state devices. They have civilian applications and they also have military application. And the, the authorities have not really realized this change that has gone on. And then also you have the commingling of Beltway Band and spin-off companies with the university and it's kind of hard to tell where one begins and the other one ends. And you, you have this stuff slopping over in, 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 into the academe, in, into commercial enterprises. 
And the whole idea that we have a secret we can put in the safe is almost obsolete. Mm -hmm. And this needs to be addressed. And perhaps, again, we're getting a wake-up call here, like you better act and you better act soon to prevent this transfer of military technology under the civilian guise to potential economic and military enemies. And, and the oversight is coming from from what the, the the U.S. Department of Defense, Homeland Security, or I mean, is there any? Uh, well, the Department of Commerce actually uh, has to license exports of dual-use technology, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know this is this has been. Uh, it, it used to be the Department of State, and then during the Clinton administration, when uh, when uh, Loral wanted to uh, to send satellites to China to be launched because it was cheaper to have them launched in China, mm. they had to get a license, and the Department of State was not giving them the license. So they made a lot of political contributions in the in the Clinton. campaign in order to get the permission switched from the Department of State to the Department of Commerce. And then the Department of Commerce gave them permission to send their satellites to China. So uh, there, there's, an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of working on loopholes. Uh, and, and as I say, you know, it's not that they actually broke the law, but they, but they manipulated the system to get what they wanted, which was to send this technology to China. Well, and that still can be illegal. And there, I know that there's a Michigan law that, that says that um, it's a felony offense to, to do uh, legal acts in illegal ways, you know, uh, or vice versa. I, I, I think it's that. But, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, uh, disguise there. And uh, we have a lot more to talk about, so I know we're going to be coming back uh, to the show um, with Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Smith. And uh, we want to thank you, the viewer, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us again here on Power Corrupts Again. I am David Scheid, and I'm in the studio with Dr. William Kaufman and Dr. Douglas Smith, both retired University of Michigan professors who have been out for quite some time now blowing the whistle on U of M President Mary Sue Coleman, the U of M Board of Regents, the new Michigan Governor Rick Snyder, Senator Carl Levin, and others that the University of Michigan administration seems to have in their back pockets. Now, to use this segment of Power Corrupts again to illustrate a principal point of concern that we began talking about in the last segment, I ask you, the viewer, to just imagine for a minute the following scenario taking place in Dr. Kaufman's presence. During the morning of Friday, August 16, 1991, in a pleasant neighborhood somewhere near downtown Moscow, Dr. Bill Kaufman sat at a conference table in the headquarters of the Soviet Air Force. With him were fellow members of the United States Air Force delegation led by General John Jaquish. He was then the Secretary of the United States Air Force Acquisition. He and Dr. Kaufman were meeting with the Commander-in-Chief of the Soviet Air Force, Yevgeny Shapushnikov, and his staff. On the agenda was future U.S.-Soviet aviation cooperation. At the beginning of this discussion, pleasantries were exchanged and General Jaquish presented to General Shaposhnikov a substantial model of the recently initiated new U.S. stealth fighter aircraft, the Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor. While General Shaposhnikov expressed his heartfelt gratitude for such a gift, he hinted that such gratefulness was tempered 
by the knowledge that it was only because America had long denied Russia the technology and the know-how that the Soviets were not able to build their own versions of the fighter aircraft, and that as a result, America was able to maintain its advantage in having superior industrial and military technology. On the evening following that meeting in Dr. Kaufman's presence, Mikhail Gorbachev was placed under house arrest at his Crimean vacation dacha by a group of hard-line communist descendants, the Gang of Eight, as the demise of the Soviet Union had begun. Since then, scholars who have analyzed the collapse of the Soviet Union have noted that the denial of critical information to the Soviet by the United States played a large role in that Cold War collapse. Fast forward now to January 11, 2011. The media just recently devoted great coverage to a prideful Chinese unveiling and the first flight at Chengdu, one of central China's aviation centers, of the Chinese's new fifth generation stealth fighter aircraft with an appearance strikingly similar to a large F-22 with canards. A New York Times article which can be found at their website summarizes just some of the relevant information about that unveiling. Now since that unveiling I have noticed many stories coming out including one just this past weekend by the Associated Press with the mainstream media quoting some guy in the Royal United Services Institute in London who is trying to say that the Chinese probably got this stealth technology from the Serbs, perhaps from a crashed fighter plane that was downed around 1999 during the Bosnian conflict. I think we can put that question to rest right here and now, can't we, Dr. Kaufman? Well, certainly some of the pieces were helpful. But as far as the aerodynamics, no, the F-117 looks totally different from the F-22. Mm. Okay. Well, most people, many people, too many people, consider China to be the cute, cuddly little panda bear, forgetting that China is also a fire-breathing dragon. Mm. And when you, when you assess China, there are some basic ethical problems. And, you know, you can get down these things almost every day. You can find something in a newspaper. But if you look at the history of the communist government in China, um, recently information came out that they've killed 70 million of their own people during their rise to power and the subsequent cultural revolution and the Great Leap Forward. That far exceeds the number of people who tragically were killed in World War II and other <clears throat> pogroms that we've been through. So the, the Chinese have done that, <clears throat> okay. Tiananmen Square, which probably a lot of people remember, <clears throat> 1989, thousands of people were killed when the troops fired upon the crowd assembled. Um, <clears throat> and you look right now with Tibet and the Uyghurs in Western China, <clears throat> their shootings on yearly, monthly in the streets of these people who are non-Han non Chinese. Um, <clears throat> you know, we don't like them, so we're going to abuse them. Mm -hmm. And then just months ago, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize for this year was Chinese. And he's in prison. And what did they do? They locked his wife up under house arrest. Okay. Then we have, you know, the Chinese well known for their global hacking. Uh, with Google, mm -hmm. uh, and that involved the university that the University of Michigan is associated with in China. And then recently we found out that a large percentage of the world's email was routed through Chinese routers briefly for a period of time where they could intercept everything. We all know about poisonous Chinese products that are on the world market, lead and paint and uh, poisonous dog food, and et cetera. And then you look at, at the elephants of the world, okay, the sharks, they're on the verge of extinction because of Chinese poaching and, and taking these animals to eat or make things out of, mm -hmm. you know, likely extinction of perhaps the elephant and the shark, and also building a road across the Serengeti National, International World Park so that they can bring rare earth metals uh, and, uh, to, to the port to ship them to China. So, the Chinese are not someone who's improved the value of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. okay? 
and we we have to look at them in that context. I mean, it's it's not only cheap stuff at, at, at the big box stores, but which some people.